So hi, my name is Dave Maynard. I'm here with uh, the original man in blue, Mr. Johnny Cash, called so because of his blue hair. And apparently this morning we've been dubbed the fantastically fabulous hacking duo or something like that. So yeah, we're pretty happy about that. We, did, we were going to get matching costumes and stuff, but that seemed a bit odd. So we're going to start off with uh, you know, a little bit of an introduction about uh, why we're here and stuff like that. So we're going to be talking about device drivers, specifically Wi-Fi device drivers. You know, the subtitle of our, uh, our presentation is Don't Build a House on a Shaky Foundation. Can we share a mic, or is this going to work? No, this is your one. OK. Mm. I've never been accused of that before. <laughs> So uh, just to level set some people's expectations and things like that, I've heard lots of rumors about this presentation. We won't be killing anybody live on stage. I'm, I'm sorry. Also, uh, I didn't quit my job to give this presentation. I, I also won't be talking about voice over IP. So, um, so basically, uh, the, the subtitle of our talk is Don't Build a House on a Shaky Foundation. And one of the things that we've been finding a lot lately is that OS vendors, as much as a lot of people hate to admit it, OS vendors like Microsoft, uh, Apple, you know, Linux distributions and things like that have been hardening their operating systems a lot. So attackers have two choices pretty much. They can either go up to the application layer and do things like file inclusion or SQL injection attacks, or they can go low, uh, basically down into the device driver level. And you know, I'm sure a lot of people have had experiences where they'll plug in a new device or install a device driver and something weird happens and they get a lot of blue screens. Uh, you know, that, that's generally because the, uh, the code quality from a security standpoint of the device drivers just generally isn't all that good. So, the, you know, this is the, uh, the, the, that was the overview of the problem. Uh, now, uh, some of the things we're going to be talking about is, uh, is, you know, basically the gist of this entire thing, I'm sure a lot of people are here to see this, is uh, breaking into a laptop remotely over Wi-Fi. And one of the questions that we got a lot was, well, you know, if you have a, a vulnerability that targets a specific device driver, you know, on a specific type of platform or something like that. How, um, you know, how useful is that? Because you can't really remotely tell, uh, you know, what chipset and things like that you're running. Strangely enough, we can. Mr. Johnny Cash's uh, work will show how we can fingerprint device drivers remotely down to, you know, the, uh, the chipset, the version, and even down to the version of the driver, which would make, you know, an attack more accurate. We're going to be talking a little bit about finding and exploiting vulnerabilities, uh, you know, shell code design, and of course, and all estimation points to demos, which you know should be pretty interesting. So you know, speed to market is so important. You know, a lot of hardware manufacturers, you know, they have to ship things quickly. I mean, like the 802.11n stuff you're seeing now, and WiMAX are, are pretty good examples of that. You know, people are getting pushed to get stuff out the door as quickly as possible. And one of the things that you know often gets sacrificed in you know the speed game is security. As long as it works and people can use it, you know, that's all that matters to a lot of people when they ship stuff. So, you know, that means that a lot of things just don't get tested properly. And one of the reasons that we're talking about this topic is we're hoping uh, to improve vendor awareness about a lot of these problems before, you know, you're having Wi-Fi drivers or Wi-Fi devices and things like that that are giving you, you know, much longer ranges. Because right now an attack, you know, uh, you have to be in local proximity, which is, you know, the range of eight, something like 802.11b, which is going to be a couple hundred feet at most. But, you know, as the ranges and things like that, you know, increase, these problems aren't fixed, this could be you know, a serious problem if you have access to somebody's machine 10 miles away. So, uh, you know, new hardware and committee design protocols, Mr. Michael and used to always say that committee design protocols were very, very bad. Uh, so they're, 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 they're especially susceptible to things like this. You know, what, you know, one of the things that happens a lot during like, you know, the committee design phase of a new protocol and things like that, people just don't really ask the questions. You know, the, the questions are more geared towards how do things work and not how could things go bad. So, you know, that's one of the things that, uh, that you know, we'd, we'd like to see people ask more. So, uh, although what, you know, when we're talking about is mostly focused on 802.11a, b, and g, uh, we were hoping to have some 802.11n stuff for this, but we didn't quite make it in time. Uh, but, you know, the, the, the methodology and the thought process and things like that can apply to Bluetooth, uh, you know, new 802.11 specs, and, you know, wireless data things like Edge, EVDO, and HD, HSDPA. So, have device drivers been a problem in the past? These are three, uh, three examples of device drivers, two of them, of course, in Windows. One of them is in FreeBSD. But, yeah, you know, device drivers have been exploited in the past. What's funny is we're not talking about something that, you know, a lot of people don't know about. It's just that uh, a lot of people don't know about the severity of the issue. I mean, examples that are on the screen are things like the Symantec uh, 
firewall DNS overflow from a couple of years ago. That, that was in the device driver. You have the TCP IP uh, vulnerability, you know, that was discovered by ISS, uh, Neil Mehta. It was an IP options off by one uh, bug. It was in uh, tcpip.sys. You have the server-service uh, -service vulnerability that was just recently released, and even a FreeBSD Wi-Fi integer overflow that was, you know, fixed and patched a couple of months ago. So, you know, there, there is a pretty dedicated history so far of, you know, people being able to remotely uh, exploit device drivers. And one thing people don't think about are that these device drivers generally do parse a lot of untrusted code. A lot of, a lot of resistance I've, I've encountered from people about the easeability uh, and the actual feasibility of exploiting these things are, well, you're, you're in kernel space or, you know, you, you're at a high privilege level. So if you do something bad like, you know, dereference a null pointer or, you know, something like that, you blue screen the box. And, you know, that, that's pretty much true, but you've got to uh, keep in mind that people with unlimited amount of time and like, you know, Firefly episodes on DVD can spend a lot of time looking at these things. So, and I mean, uh, that, that's pretty much what we've had to do, but, you know, personally, I'm a Battlestar Galactica fan, so I spent time with that in Hot Pockets, of course. And, of course, uh, you know, this is the thing that I've gotten most questions about, is if I had something to do with these in Intel patches that came out this weekend. And I like to categorically at this time say, no, 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 we didn't. Although, uh, we do think it's pretty interesting that, you know, the, the, the timing of it. I mean, it, they were released on Sunday. Almost like they, <laughs> they were released right before a certain talk or something like that. I, I don't know. But it seemed like, a, it, it seemed a, a bit suspicious. But, you know, one of the things I have to do is, I, you know, I haven't, I haven't had a chance to look at any of these patches or uh, evaluate them or reverse engineer them and find out what the vulnerabilities were. But, you know, you have, to, uh, you have to admire a company that would proactively fix things before a talk instead of waiting until afterwards. So that, that's pretty cool. So, um, let's see. You mute yours. I'm going to mute mine now. Okay, so hopefully this works out. All right, I'm going to end up holding my mic tight and uh, typing, so this might not go so well. Let's try it, though. So uh, Dave's been talking about device drivers in general, and uh, he's the really smart ring zero ninja guy between us, and I'm more of the 802.11 standards all day kind of guy. So I don't really do that much kernel coding, so I'm going to talk about the protocol and uh, some of the inherent complexities of it, which turns out to be the real big problem that we're, we're exploiting. So uh, 802.11, why is it so complicated and does it have to be, can we fix it? And uh, the consequences of it being so complicated are that you can fingerprint it and you can exploit it. So we'll get to those. So why is it so complicated? I think my friend Warlord, and I think it was Warlord, my other Silk friends might disagree, but uh, said fear leads to anger, anger leads to hate, and hate leads to protocols designed by committee. Maybe, maybe it's protocols designed by committee lead to hate. I'm not sure, but uh, you know, it's just, it's too big. And I'll show you why it's too big in a minute. But nobody could conceivably implement this entire standard correctly in like less than a year, in my opinion. So, uh, so why is 802.11 so complicated? Well, partly because it's too ambitious. Partly because it really has to deal with more, you know, it really is a more complex problem than Ethernet. And some of the, you know, the complexity comes from the fact that there's hidden nodes, there's consistently unreliable links, and there's other networks on the same channel, you know. Simple Ethernet device drivers, and you know, that's what we're usually dealing with, don't have to deal with anything like that. So uh, what could you do to fix it? Well, is this, I'm, I'm like a, a standards Nazi. My friends would probably agree that uh, I think you should implement the standard like as much as you can. But for 802.11, I think that you should be able to get some sort of certification for something like 802.11 minus minus. 802.11 that works mostly, but uh, ignores a lot of stuff that shouldn't be there. So uh, what could you ignore? Well, most management frames, I think. I think a number of deauths and disassociate packets sent in the role that are sent by illegitimate hackers versus your access point kicking you off your network is probably a pretty bad ratio right now. There's nothing you can do about it. And, uh, similarly for some control frames and some extra features which are coming up. So like I said, the whole reason we're interested in all this complexity is because complexity is a hacker's best friend. If it's not complex, then people can't do it incorrectly and we need somebody to do it wrong so we can get code execution. So I'm going to compare 802.11 to Ethernet because everybody I think in the room is probably familiar with Ethernet. If I gave out, you know, six, 14 bytes and said this is an Ethernet header, a lot of people could figure out what it said. So Ethernet has, you know, three fields, source, destination, and type. 802.11 has a version, a type, a subtype, eight flags, one, two, three, or four addresses in variable positions, a fragrance number, a sequence number, and uh, then you're through the 
normal header. After that, you've got a whole bunch of extra packets to keep track of. 11 management frames, six control frames, lots of subtypes, and various encryption fields. And so that is just so much more complex than a, than an Ethernet device driver, which is what most people think of when they think network device driver. And okay, if typical fields in the header aside, what else does it have? Well, it's got ad hoc mode. So uh, how many people here have actually used an ad hoc network to do something productive? Just, okay. Yeah, so that's why we should cut it out of the standard, or at least make it optional. Power savings. Now, power savings is good, and it probably actually does help with battery life a lot in certain embedded cases. And I don't think, you know, I think that is probably overhead worth keeping. But it imposes a significant amount of overhead on the guy, the access point. And so if I was going to start fuzzing access points, which I haven't done yet, I would probably start messing around there. Uh, it's got two types of media access control, PCF versus DCF. Most people don't even know it, but the 802.11 standard is littered with words that nobody cares about about PCF, which is basically a wireless token ring, more or less. You can imagine how many vendors jumped to implement that. I mean, token ring is awesome, right? It's a simplification, but I mean, how many people are going to implement that? No one did, but it's still in there, so you've got to at least skip through it. Uh, 11E, quality of service. I think this one made it, you know, it's going to come going to be part of the standard pretty soon. I'm not sure how much this is going to help. So how many people are trying to do video conferencing on a wireless network that doesn't hit a wired network where there's no quality of service? Like, so you're all on the same access point trying to hold a video conference, then quality of service helps out a lot, right? But you're within a couple hundred feet of each other. <laughs> I mean, the other net side doesn't have, care, give a damn about your quality of service packets. Those fields get stripped. Nobody cares upstream. So I don't see how much of an improvement that could make. And uh, just to show you like the, the sort of attitude they have, if somebody at one of the 802.11 committee me meetings told me that geolocating was proposed, which means like the access point has some sense of its location, and so do you. So you either try to tell the access point where you are, or it's trying to tell you where you are, like with GPS coordinates or some other coordinate system. What the hell does that have to do with media access control? Like that is not a layer two standard kind of thing to throw in there. I mean, that's not going to go in, but people are proposing that, I hear. It's crazy. So, so if you were to remove all these extras and uh, come to what I've called 802.11 minus minus, what would you end up with? Well, a Nintendo DS, actually. I, uh, <laughs> it's not at all certified for anything. It, uh, it's no Wi-Fi certs, nowhere near 802.11 compliant. Ignores, deos, and disassociates. I think it ignores most control packets. Works great. <laughs> you know why? I, like, I you know how I figured this out? I ran my fuzzer against it. And nothing happened. We're, uh, <laughs> we're not sponsored by Nintendo, by the way. Yeah, I know. I mean, this is just the only example I've seen in the real world of somebody who took the 802.11 standard and said, you know, you know, chop it in half, and we got something that works. And you can't. I couldn't get this thing to do anything except do what it was supposed to. And it, it probably doesn't roam very well. Again, how many people want their Nintendo DS to roam between access points, right? When you're flying down the highway or something, playing your video games. <laughs> so, so that is why 802.11 is so unnecessarily complicated, in my opinion. Is there anybody in here from the IEEE? Because I'm probably going to get lynched afterward. My, my thesis advisor disagrees strongly, by the way. But. So, so fingerprinting 802.11, why bother? Well, the obvious one is, so we've got a, if you happen to have a pocket full of wireless OD and you want to know who to hit what with, then you'd like to know what sort of device driver they've got. There's other legitimate uses too. Uh, wireless IDS vendors could monitor users, chipset and driver, and you could potentially use this to refine operating system fingerprints if that was your real goal. But, uh, so the, basically the wireless IDS case is so uh, company